Since 1968, the Private Education Assistance Committee, or PEAC, trustee of the Fund for Assistance to Private Education, has been an effective partner of government and the private education sector in operationalizing the complementarity between private and public schools towards an integrated Philippine education system that will benefit the Filipino learners. In recognition of the valuable contribution of the private education sector to the country's development, the Fund for Assistance to Private Education, or FAPE, a permanent and irrevocable trust fund for the programs of assistance to private education, was established on November 5, 1968, through Executive Order 156, Series of 1968, which also constituted the PEAC. The PEAC is composed of the Secretary of the Department of Education as the ex-officio chair and the representative each from the National Economic Development Authority, Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities, and Association of Christian Schools, Colleges and Universities. For the development of private education in the country, the PEAC fulfills its roles as funder, advocate, partner, and enabler. A national secretariat headed by an executive director implements the policies, programs, and initiatives of the PEAC for private education. The PEAC is also present in 16 regions through its regional secretariats. Presidents of credible private educational institutions and associations in the regions are invited by the PEAC to become regional program directors and to host the regional secretariats in their respective institutions. The regional program directors designate regional program coordinators for the day-to-day -day operations of the regional secretariats. To ensure the growth of FAPE and its other funds, the PEAC constituted an investment advisory group and has engaged external fund managers whose performance is reviewed regularly. The PEAC has also provided assistance to public policy development and advocacy initiatives that support the improvement and sustainability of the private education sector. It worked with the sector for the passage of a landmark piece of legislation that is anchored on the principle of complementarity in the Philippine education system, which the Philippine Constitution has long recognized. In 1989, Republic Act No. 6728, or the Government Assistance to Students and Teachers in Private Education, or GASPE, was legislated. GASPE, which was amended by Republic Act No. 8545 in 1998, institutionalized government assistance to private education in the country. The PEAC was involved in the development of the Education Service Contracting, or ESC, one of the programs identified by the GASPE law, from piloting a scheme which was a precursor to the ESC in 1982 to 1986, to implementing the ESC in 1986 to 1991, and from 1996 up to the present. Given the track record of the PEAC in program management, the Department of Education continues to contract the PEAC to co-implement the ESC, the in-service training or inset, and thereafter the Senior High School Voucher Program when Republic Act 10533 expanded the beneficiaries of DepEd's GASPEP program to learners in grades 11 and 12. The PEAC has the following responsibilities in the GASPEP program. Orientation for participating schools, certification of ESC schools, SHS voucher application, processing of billing statements, monitoring, resolving cases of schools with adverse findings, regular meetings and consultations with stakeholders, research and data gathering, and in-service training for junior high school and senior high school administrators and teachers. The Commission on Higher Education and UNIFAS Board also engaged the PEAC to co-implement the Tertiary Education Subsidy, or TES, program for private higher education institutions in academic year 2019 to 2020. The TES is one of the programs under Republic Act No. 10931, or the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education Act. The PEAC is accredited as a continuing professional development provider by the Professional Regulation Commission. Training programs designed and implemented by the PEAC have been awarded CPD credit units by the PRC, which participants can use for the renewal of their professional licenses. 
It also supports research that will help the private education sector improve educational delivery and its implementation of government subsidy programs at the school level. The efficiency of the PEAC to implement programs on a national scale is further strengthened with its development and management of systems to handle various processes, enterprise information system, information management system, voucher management system, online voucher application portal, certification system, program monitoring system, training and development system, and TES management system. The PEAC also implements its own programs for the private education sector. The assistance to programs and initiatives to reform education for private educational associations. The research for school improvement towards excellence for private school administrators and teachers writing their thesis and dissertation. The dissemination assistance to research and education for school administrators and faculty members who will present their papers in international conferences abroad. The Leading for Educational Achievement Program for private schools working on their areas for improvement towards PEAC certification. The Rethinking Education, Championing and Accelerating School Transformation for private schools making the transition to online learning. The Philippine Education Research Journal for decision makers, policy makers, and practitioners in education. And the Philippine Education Conference and the PEAC Educational Leadership Series or LEADER for school leaders and other training programs that address the needs of the sector. Recognizing the efficiency, diversity, and innovativeness of the private schools in achieving quality in Philippine education, the PEAC is committed to promoting private education as an integral part of our education system. We invite everyone to pray. Almighty God, we praise and thank you for gathering us all in this webinar today. We pray that you bless abundantly all those who are involved in this webinar. We seek your divine providence that the activity set for today be successful and fruitful. Allow us to gain invaluable knowledge and learning experiences from this activity. Be with us as we aspire for enlightenment in this time of uncertainty. Help us to continuously seek your wisdom, guidance, and strength. Inspire us to work tirelessly for the betterment of all those who have placed their trust and confidence in the institutions we are part of. Guide us to always lead and speak with integrity so that our thoughts, words, and actions may reflect what is right, good, and just. Grant us the humility to always seek your will in all that we do and say. Amen.
Good morning. Magandang magandang umaga po uh, sa inyong lahat. Uh, and welcome to the second day of uh, Leader 3, which uh, the PAC has themed education, education for Social Transformation in the 21st Century. Ako po si Doris Fernandez Ferrer. I'm the Executive Director of the Private Education Assistance Committee. And uh, as uh, uh, by way of introduction, for those of you who are not very familiar with the work of the PAC, the PAC uh, co-implements the Senior High School Voucher Program, the Junior High School Education Service Contracting Program, and the Teacher Salary Subsidy, which are uh, programs institutionally owned by the Department of Education. Uh, kami po ay nagagalak that you are with us uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, we would assume, a lot of you are school heads, uh, school teachers, uh, principals, school directors. You are right now in the middle of preparing for school year 2021-2022. And uh, we just survived a very exciting and exacting school year 2020-2021. I'd like to recall with you that in July of last year, we actually started LEADER, which uh, at that time discussed uh, uncompromising quality amidst COVID-19. We talked about fiscal discipline. We talked about future-proofing education. And we concluded LEADER 1 with educating the conscience. At that time, you had Brother Armin Luistro and Father June Virai. We had LEADER 2 in December when we thought that, you know, it is not a uh, correct to think of Philippine education being in a vacuum. So we thought that we wanted to deal with uh, societal issues, uh, which are, are very relevant uh, for all of us teachers and formators. So we had a talk on human rights by um, attorney Chel Diokno. We had a talk on historical revisionism with Professor John Neri, and uh, a topic which is very close to our hearts at this time as uh, formators and as teachers which is social media as a force for good. And we had Professor Christian Esguera uh, speaking in December. All of these uh, leader sessions uh, are very valuable uh, you know, sessions you can use for faculty development activities and even in the classrooms of junior high schools and senior high schools, because we all realize that we are in a very, very uh, crucial period in our history and that we really need all hands on deck. So today we are continuing with Leader 3 and we're very proud of our series uh, for the last uh, two days. Yesterday we had the rule of law as a foundation of democracy and we had Dean Tony Lavinia uh, speaking and then we had two reactors. Uh, we had attorney uh, Ada Abad and uh, Father Attorney I.J. Chan Gonzaga no? uh, from Ad Adamson University and Atene de Manila University, respectively. And today, we continue with our uh, uh, discussions on, uh, as I said, matters, no? which are very crucial, especially in light of the 2022 elections. We are uh, discussing today commitment to the common good and the Filipino. And I'd like to read uh, how we like uh, conceptualized uh, this uh, session. There is personal good and there is the common good. And the two do not instinctively meet. The former pertains to people's propensity towards self-preservation and acting on self-interest, while the latter generally pertains to what is beneficial for all or most members of society. For a society to prosper, institutions, foremost of which is government, must actively act towards the promotion of the common good, a convergence between self-interest and working for the general welfare must be realized, which is mostly easier said than done. As a people, do we know where we stand in terms of valuing the common good? As parents and educators, how do we teach this value to our students amidst the economic, environmental, political, and social realities we are facing right now. So, uh, mabigat ang ating pag-uusapan ngayong umaga. At uh, we are very privileged to have with us uh, as main discussant, Professor Victor Andres Dindo Manhit. He's the founder and managing director of the Strat-based group, 
a research and strategic advisory consultancy firm and president of its policy think tank, Strat-based Albert Del Rosario Institute for Strategic and International Studies. He was a former chair and retired associate professor of political science of De La Salle University, Manila. He has authored numerous commentaries and papers on geopolitical issues, governance, and political reforms. He obtained his master's degree in public administration and bachelor's degree in Philippine studies, major in political science and history from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. A member of Phi Gamma Mu International Honor Society, Beta Chapter, he specializes in strategic studies and management, legislative research, and public policy analysis. His research interests and field of specialization had led him to pursue active involvement in legislation, bureaucratic work, and civil society advocacy. Among the government positions he held include Undersecretary for External Affairs and Special Concerns of the Department of Education, Deputy Secretary for Administration and Financial Services of the Philippine Senate. Meanwhile, his legislative experience encompasses the 8th, 9th, 10th, and the 12th Congress as the Chief of Staff of the late former Senator President Edgardo Angara and Senior Policy Research Advisor in key Senate committees such as Education, Agriculture, Economic Affairs, Social Justice, Electoral Reforms, and Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Laws. Since 1987, he has been involved in all national elections in different capacities, from policy consultancy to campaign strategy. After his stint in government, he became involved in many different consortiums and networks of civil society groups as lead uh, convener of citizen-led initiative Democracy Watch Philippines and convener of pro-industry group Philippine Business for Environmental Stewardship. Similarly, his involvement with the Distinguished Philippine Trade Foundation is aligned with the group's commitment toward building a strategic and reformed business environment. His international reach is evident in his key role in the establishment of the U.S.-Philippine Strategic Initiative with the Philippine Eminent Persons Group and is also an advisor to the Board of Asia Society Philippines, another cooperative organization, this time in the area of education. Moreover, he was appointed as one of the ASEAN Regional Forum experts and eminent persons by the Department of Foreign Affairs. Today, he regularly contributes opinion pieces to leading newspapers, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and the Business World. Professor Dindo Mangit, we're very happy to see you, to be with you uh, this morning in this forum. And we hope that after this forum, you will be in other meetings of the PAC because we have a lot of uh, concerns as well in the area of uh, public-private partnership. Joining us as the reactor is uh, Father Danny Pilario, a member of the Congregation of the Mission, Vincentians in the Philippines. He's a professor of St. Vincent's School of Theology, Adamson University in Quezon City, and he comes from Hagdan Oslob, Cebu, finished his undergraduate philosophy at Adamson University, his bachelor in theology at the University of Santo Tomas, and his master's and doctoral degrees at the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. Did I pronounce that right? This is very, very uh, you know, uh, difficult, uh, Father Danny. His book, Back to the Rough Grounds of Praxis, Exploring Theological Method with Pierre Bourdieu, was awarded the John N. Marie Huiz Prize of the Louvain, Louvain Academic Foundation as the best research in the humanities in 2003. He has also written, after the end, Reflections of the Happy Theologian in and, in and on the Rough Grounds in 2014. Father Danny is the Dean of St. Vincent School of Theology of Adamson University and he has written and edited numerous books and journals. You can uh, follow him on his Facebook page, and he has a lot of theological musings there. He's also a former president and founding member of the Dakateo, the Catholic Theological Society of the Philippines. He is a professorial lecturer of different universities and seminaries in the country, 
and regularly ministers at a garbage dump site parish in Payatas, Quezon City on weekends. A personal friend, I can describe Father Dan in three words, faith in action. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to Professor Dindo Manhit and then to be followed by Father Danny Pilario. Thank you, Darius. Uh, thank you to PEAC for this opportunity to be part of your program. Allow me to share some slides that I have prepared that focuses on how I relate one of my key advocacies when I was still teaching in the university, which I call meaningful citizenship. And I related to your topic this morning and the commitment to the common good and to the Filipino people. So I've asked my colleague to help share our slide, please. The reality of where we are, as I wait for my slides to be shared, is that last year, COVID or the declaration of a global pandemic created for us an environment that challenges not only government, but also society as a whole. And within society, our families and citizens. We have seen how this continuing public health crisis that we deal with today at this moment has evolved into challenging economic consequences to the Filipino people. More so, it opened us to the reality, the sad reality of Philippine society, generational inequality, now more compounded by the pandemic especially if we look at it from, I think, the education sector, imagine the digital divide. I introduce computer education, computer laboratories, to the Department of Education, Culture, and Sports when I was serving government in 1999. Imagine where we are now and how I saw the digital divide to shape how our young children are young students who deal with the realities of livelihood and jobs in the future. Now, pandemic has told us or shared with us that when we build our economy simply along the service-driven, consumption-driven economy, it will be challenging in crisis situation like this. So how can we turn this into an opportunity for one that is investment-driven economic growth, harnessing the capacity or the opportunity to play a stronger role in trade, not only globally, but even simply regionally. Just this morning, I spent my morning with environmental activists. We had this discussion as early as eight o'clock in key areas of the Philippines about a green economic recovery. Not only dealing with COVID, but recovering with a green economic thinking in mind? Or how do we deal with the reality of a threat to the Filipino people, to our Filipino fisher folks in the West Philippine Sea? And sad to say that even during this pandemic, you hear of stories of possible corruption. In the procurement vaccines, procurement of testing kits, which is critical in recovering. You know, we started this year, and I've shared this thought, and I wanted to share it uh, to those who are viewing this conference. I wrote about it in the Philippine Daily Inquirer, my first commentary for the year 2021. And I said, what we need is political integrity on public interest. And I wrote this line. 2020 has been the most challenging period for the Duterte administration, 
One which is populist, one which is quite sad to say, very divisive and polarizing. But when you deal with COVID, when you deal with the pandemic, when you deal with the economic sufferings of the people, you want that the Philippine government and society that is now confronted with all these problems can work together. That's why I said there is an opportunity to get government on one side to work with society as a whole and undertake productive partnerships towards recovery. And as I build on that argument, I want to share what are we dealing with. In Stratbase, we pride ourselves with commentaries, with analysis, simply based on what we call data-driven, evidence-based. Maybe it's my training as a social scientist for nearly 26 years at the De La Salle University. So allow me to share key data points. And from there, I will build on the need for that commitment to the common good. Allow me to share data uh, that we are actually running at this moment. We are finishing the field and analyzing it. So we'll have newer data, but what I can still share is what we've had uh, towards the end of the first part. Just look at this data. What does it tell us? We all hear daily about COVID. Even government simply talks about COVID without realizing that COVID has brought about other consequences. Where we are, our public, because I've always believed on understanding the public, listening to the needs of the public. It's about, I'll use the Filipino translation to this, presyo ng bilihin, which is controlling inflation. It's about kita, or pay of workers. It's about trabaho, or creating more jobs. It's about dealing with poverty, because with poverty, you have to deal with hunger. Can you realize COVID is simply a fifth concern? And historically, we have seen this even pre-COVID. Something that I wanted to share was that this government has been so powerful in social media, telling how great they are. But how can they be great when our people continue to suffer from basic economic challenges? More so now, after the pandemic. And something that we track annually also is how do we understand this concern as it relates personally to people? Basic needs, fear of illness, the need for food, livelihood and income, ensuring that our children finish in school, even though we have free public education up to the tertiary level. It's still a challenge. And we have seen it through the years, from the previous administration up to this administration. Because I think the public knows a good education leads you to a better income, better livelihood opportunity. So it's very critical. How can we get government to focus on important concerns? not on populist rhetorics, not on spreading disinformation, not on creating our own pandemic disinformation. Early part of our lockdown last year, I started talking about the, this idea, I call it whole of society. This was April of 2020. Imagine where we are. Imagine where you were, April 15, 2020. Wrote about it, had it published in our institute. Because what I was seeing was that it was all about how great the government is in dealing with COVID. As if they're dictating everything. I can still remember the picture or the TV coverage of the president sitting and behind the military in battle fatigues. And I told my team, 
and write something about it. And I'd like to push this idea. And I have not stopped since then. I said is what we need is a whole of society response, not a whole of government. It's not about President Duterte, his cabinet and his military officials. It's about a whole of society. Remember, they came up with this healing as one. But here I argue, what it requires is that we involve both government and non-government actors. And with non-government actors, I'm not referring to traditional NGOs, but all actors, private sector, investors or the business sector, civil society organizations, even families in their communities. We have seen that, how community pantry spread. In the first quarter or the end of the first quarter of this year, here I argue that we need to emphasize that national government does not have a monopoly on the solution to the health crisis. And now I'd like to add, remember, I said this in April, the national government does not have a monopoly on the solutions to this crisis that we're dealing with beyond health, that means economic recovery. We need meaningful participation, not from traditional organized sectoral organizations, but meaningful participation by the people themselves, by the public themselves, beyond the sector. We need to be more inclusive and we need to build on the value of cooperation. That's why I argued a few weeks after when we published this, is that only with the whole of society approach. And I kept on emphasizing that. So here I am trying to bring this idea. And the first thing we did was after I published this, we brought different stakeholders in health in our first webinar, I think a week after this publication of my commentary. I said, it's about crisis, good governance and opportunities, but it needs a whole of society approach to deal with this deadly and invisible end. Do I simply talk about it? Do I simply write about it? Well, Stratface has been actively involved in bringing vaccines to the private sector. We could have brought it earlier. Because the first thing I did, or we did as a group, was after I started writing about it, we knocked on the door of the private sector and said, you guys have a role to play. We brought people together to our own webinars because of our limitation, because of lockdown, that we need a broader approach to dealing with COVID. That's why when we hit August, I was talking about we need a new deal. I spoke of the need that for government not only be to be transparent and accountable in the distribution of relief, but also we need necessary institutional reforms in terms of achieving a stable, balanced policy environment in addressing pressing economic reforms. I was flagging already things like there is an economic consequence to this long lockdown that we had last year. But we need to build the recovery on an investment and stakeholder-driven economy. That means whole of society, Working together, we might have our own interests. We might have our own priorities, but we shall recover in a clear multi-stakeholder road together. And what can bind us to build on that? The idea of a common good. Maybe as a society, we need to see ourselves step out of our comfort zone of family being members of clans, being members of uh, school friends, school associates, business associates, and see ourselves as real citizens. Citizen in the Philippines has been simply a legal term written in our constitution, in a section in the Philippine constitution. But what I want and what I've been advocating since last year is that this whole of society approach, at the core of it, is citizenship, meaningful citizenship. 
the idea that ordinary citizens that is part of a family can see themselves contributing to the nation. I used to joke my students, it's about dying for a country. We don't need people to die. People, we need people to live, to contribute. It means active commitment. It means being responsible, making a difference in one's community. Imagine when I saw all those community pantries, March, April of this year. I said, this is what we need in our country. Thinking not only of your safety, of your concern, but thinking not only of your neighbors, but thinking of community. And within this community, the Philippine community, is a Filipino people, the Filipino nation. I've always advocated for empowering individuals and families to take back their neighborhoods. Imagine when I, and I've been saying this for years. I, hand, I used to handle a course when I used to teach citizenship and governance. The key, people misunderstand what governance is all about. They think it's about government. I always tell them that's governing. But governance means there are different societal actors that as a nation, we can engage, we can debate, but we can find a common goal, common good. So when I got this opportunity to be invited to speak with you, I said, oh, something close to my heart. Since the early 2000s, when I introduced help introduce that course at the De La Salle University. So I've always argued to attain that common good is we need meaningful citizenship. We need right governance. It means standing up, resisting. I always tell my students, the control and influence of political elites. We hear of political dynasties. I always say, are they the only one? who deserves to be elected? How come political dynasties who are public officials are the only one who can afford elections, consider the expense of elections? So I always remind listeners when I get invited to speak about political, electoral, and governance reforms, we need as a society to resist Political elites, political dynasties. I have nothing against political leaders. It's part of a political system. I myself, my middle name, my grandfather used to be a member of Congress. Some of my cousins in a different province are still members of Congress. But some of us, we, we decided to move on to, to our own career. It cannot be passed on. First thing I learned from my, from my family, considering I'm very political when I was young. So I concentrated on focusing on my effort on other issues. Though I was in the Department of Education, I could have used it to build my own lines. But I said, no, you have to resist this continuous cycle of political dynasties, political leadership that is rooted on abusing, using government resources for their own political and economic power. We need to restore the values of community empowerment. I'm a product of a generation that was born in a dictatorship, entered the University of the Philippines under a dictatorship. But I saw how an empowered society, having a common good, which is what that, what is that common good? We cannot live under a dictatorship. We cannot live under authoritarian rule. Democracy might not be perfect, but it's better than authoritarian rule. And what did we have? 1986 change. We need to find a way to revitalize our economic and political institutions. I've been an advocate of what I call inclusive capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, not shareholder capitalism. That even our own business sector should see themselves as part of a broader stakeholder group, not only for profit, but also serving society better. And as champions of a common good, as we work together as one society, imagine simply, maybe this can bring us together. 
shouldn't we demand for a legislature that truly represents the people, not political dynasties? Should we not demand an independent judiciary, not loyal to those appointing powers that enforces the rule of law? That was your discussion yesterday with equal concern for all people. Don't we need political parties, not political butterflies that keeps on jumping Liberal Party in 2016, PDP Laban in 2022, and maybe after 2022, another party again, or Lakas or others. Or a military and a police, I call them a security force that are politically neutral, professional, and serves the needs and secures the people in their own communities. And what about media, especially as we evolve from traditional to social media? One that is free, independent, and unbiased. Not controlled by government, not controlled by corporations with their own corporate agenda, not controlled by elite business or political elite. I can name of newspapers now that is being used for what I call today the pandemic of disinformation since 2016. But as a society, we are all part of civil society. As citizens, in our own little way, in our own communities, as I've said earlier, let's go out and beyond the comfort zone of our families, friends, our clans, our associates, and see ourselves being part of society and acting for the common good, a watchdog role in government, and even providing additional forms of political participation, getting people to be involved, developing voter education, defining what are the issues important to the voters, for example, in 2022. I've always argued, you know, 26 years, I introduced the program of governance as the the one in charge of the course of public administration and development management in Philippines. So when I started introducing the concept of governance, I think it was 2001 when we started teaching it as a course, seminar in governance. I, I shared it with my students, it was 2001, imagine that's 20 years ago, and where are my students now? I started talking about Filipino citizens collectively needs to demand Right governance. Of course, popular you know, as good governance. We should demand that human rights and fundamental freedoms are respected. We should demand collectively as a society, as a people, that we should have a say in the decisions that affect our lives. We should demand or should hold policymakers accountable. We should demand that society in the Philippines is inclusive and fair about institutions and practices that govern us makes it inclusive, not exclusive to a few. I remember forcing my students to read books about how, how nations fail. I found this book in one of my trips. And you see why? The more inclusive a society is, the more developed they are. The more they uplift the people from poverty, the more we get them educated. The more they become educated, the more they become better citizens. Why? They started seeing themselves not simply dealing with the needs and the basic needs of their families, but now realizing what happens in society affects their family. So they need to step out of that zone. We need to discriminate against ethnicity, class, and gender. And we need to look strategically long term, especially in the areas of environment, especially in the areas of security externally in the Philippines. But we need our own economic and social policies to be responsive to the Filipinos. We have in our institute, Strat-based ADR Institute, a program called Economics with a Human Face. You have to put within that framework of economic growth data, a Filipino being challenged by poverty, hunger. So we need to ensure that Filipinos 
the policies that we that we advocate for government to do is one that will address the basic challenge of poverty, hunger. And it can only be done by creating livelihood opportunities or having enough income or having jobs. But what will bring them to that job? Better education, better health care to be more productive. But we cannot ask this from political leaders who are driven by their serve their selfish interests of just staying in power. Because with political power, it gains more economic power. We need the Filipinos to demand this from government. And we are entering an election season again. Let's remind ourselves. We are Filipino citizens. We can demand what is a common good. We can disagree on other things. But hopefully this point that I raised bring us closer to each other. The education sector is very important for that. I was a political science professor. So people ask me, why did you serve the Department of Education? For two reasons. Number one, I was chief of staff of a Senate president who led the economic education reforms. I'm talking about the late Senator Angara. I was involved in, in a lot of the education reforms in the 1990s. I joined him in 1996. So I was helping him with a lot of research and implementation. But when there was an opportunity, my the late brother Andrew was talking with Senator Angara, and two of them said, maybe we need that a vibrant young. I was 32 years old when I became undersecretary of education. And I said, it's not really my comfort zone. I was in the policy area of education, but he said, it's an opportunity to use education for the school system to talk about good citizenship. That's why after I left government, I introduced with my colleagues in LaSalle citizenship and governance. It's something close to my heart, and I will always accept any opportunity to talk about. Because as I related to what I've been advocating last year about the whole of society approach, it's about meaningful citizenship, I said. It's about committing yourself to a common good as a Filipino citizen. I'm not saying that this is a solution to our problems, but we need to restore civic responsibility. We need this Filipino, and maybe we need to build it. We cannot expect families to teach this because families are focused on other things. They, are, are, they have become our social safety net. But the social safety net simply makes them very selfish. It's always about the family. The most that they will extend themselves is the family has loyalties, which is normally ethno-linguistic, provincial loyalties, where they came from. Without realizing we are a Filipino republic, a Philippine republic, a Filipino nation. So we need to find that common good to restore civic responsibility. That is what true citizenship is all about. What makes it to be a true Filipino? What makes it that civic pride, whoever the president of the country is? So whoever that president is, he or she will serve the Filipino people, not the other way around, as if we owe them something. That's why when people ask me, how do you see 2022? I always would say, I hope the pandemic opened our reality that we don't need populist leaders. We don't need division in Philippine society. The enemy is a virus. The enemy could be outside our borders. The enemy and the competition could be other countries competing in that global pie, economic pie. But we need the Filipino people to be united as a nation. And we will never be united if we remain to appreciate the need for a common good. So I speak of a need for a civic regeneration where we harness citizens out of their self-interest, materialistic pursuit, which is what the values we normally learn from families, and into a public-spirited, civic-minded devotion to a shared national purpose of a common good. I think the Filipino people deserve nothing less. 
again. Good morning and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Professor Manhit. Uh, Father Danny, uh, would you want to uh, start with your okay. reaction presentation? Thank you very much, uh, Doris uh, and PEAC for inviting me into this uh, webinar. And thank you very much for Professor Manhit for a very hopeful and uh, future looking uh, uh, direction towards the future of Philippine society and common good. Uh, I could not agree more uh, to what he said. Uh, siguro, meron lang akong mga points na idadagdag o bibigyan ng konting example at i-contextualize sa Philippine society kung anong ibig sabihin ng working towards the direction of the common good. Meron po akong uh, three points uh, that I would like to raise in reaction and in presentation and a future presentation and reaction to the to Professor Manhit's uh, presentation. Yung una is uh, the whole of society approach versus the whole of government approach. I fully agree with what he said. No, Actually, if you look at uh, the COVID pandemic response of this government, it's actually the whole of government approach. Uh, I attended a webinar last night on uh, how they evaluated the government response to the pandemic is actually uh, a lopsided response. Parang kulang uh, at uh, hindi sapat. Um, Saan natin uh, ma makikita ito? Uh, makikita natin ito sa halimbawa yung Bayanihan to Heal as One Act. Uh, kung bibigyan natin ng acronym yan ay eh, parang BAHO, no? Parang baho, no? Act RA 11469. Pero parang itatanong natin, to heal as one nga ba ito or only to heal for some? Ako po ay nagtatrabaho sa payatas. Aside from being an academic on weekdays, I also am uh, working as uh, helping in the parish of payatas. At simula noong pandemic hanggang uh, start ng pandemic, March of 2020 hanggang ngayon, uh, yung ayuda ng gobyerno ay talagang very, very, I don't know how to describe it they can let people like line up in their distribution centers for one whole night. Some of them old people, vulnerable people. And imagine they are on the other side implementing social distancing. But if it is the government that distributes this, their goods, those rules do not apply. So to heal as one nga ba ito o to kill as one? Uh, dito rin natin nakikita yung lopsidedness of the COVID-19 budget. No? Ngayon, lumalabas na naman yan. No? Ang problema sa budget ng gobyerno. So uh, nasaan nga ba pumunta ang budget ng gobyerno? Is it, is it a, for the common good or for the good of some? So nakikita natin yung overpriced PPE to the detriment of the health and the lives of the first uh, frontliners. Ang daming doktor na namatay, March, April, May, ang dami noon. Dahil ang budget na kinuha nila for PPE is to the thousands. At alam po ninyo, Yung mga nanay na nagtatahi doon sa payatas, biktima ng EGK, we started uh, making PPEs. And it would only cost you like 300 to 500 pesos. 
So anong problema dito? Nasaan ang budget? Is it is is the bayanihan uh, uh, to heal as one uh, for all or for some? May mga example dito, may mga symbolic questions like hinuhuli yung tao na nagrarally dahil walang makain dyan sa may bandang SM North, San Roque. At the same time, inabsolve yung mga taong nagmanyanita kay Debold Sinas. So, to heal as one, common good, or the good of some. Uh, marami pong example yan. Uh, mass testing, nahihiyang i-lockdown dahil nakakahiya sa China. Marami pong ganon. Well, para sa akin, who is personally involved in, 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 in the fight against Tukang, no? pareho pa rin yung logic doon. Patayin ang iba para sa ikabubuti ng lahat. Is that common good? Or is that utilitarianism making persons the collateral damage in this pursuit of a drug-free society? So we actually, Professor Manhit is right in questioning the whole of government approach by pursuing the whole of society approach. Ang contribution ko po dito is the discourse from the Christian tradition. Dahil ako po ay isang theologian at nag-aaral, ano ba yung diskurso ng kristyanong uh, uh, tradisyon tungkol dito? Uh, many of the schools are uh, inspired by the Christian tradition, so maybe it would be good to go back to this. Uh, the Catholic social teaching, which is the foundation of the transformational education, in Christian societies and Christian schools is the foundation as the foundation called the common good. Matagal na po, Pope John the 23rd pa, 1950s, sinabi niya, what is common good? The sum total of social conditions which allow people to reach their fulfillment more fully. Uh, mas maganda siguro tatagalugin natin. Lahat ng ang common good ay lahat ng kailangan upang maabot ng bawat at lahat ng tao ang kaginhawahan. Kaginhawahan, yan, that, that, that is a very Filipino term, ginhawa. Yun lang naman talaga ang nais nating maabot sa education, sa religion, sa politics na ang bawat tao at ang lahat ng tao ay guminhawa. And that is precisely the aim of common good. Ngayon, may magandang, I, I would like to like describe common good in three terms. Common good o kaginhawahan sa ikabubuti ng bawat tao, ng buong tao, at lahat ng tao. This is a very helpful and useful definition of common good and well well-being of society and each person una bawat tao each person the whole person and all persons una bawat tao we need to emphasize the value of each and individual each individual person that means a person should not be eaten by the concerns of the whole society. We need to respect each individual person. Meron pong movement ngayon sa lipunan. Tawag po nila ay bawat isa mahalaga. Maganda yung, maganda yung term na yun. Bawat isa mahalaga. Kahit ano pang sabihin nyo, bawat isa mahalaga. Ikalawa po yung buong tao. Buong tao. Not only his economic well-being by providing jobs, etc., etc., but the whole of his person. So common good is not just about uh, economic good. We could not measure common good by GNP, GDP, gross domestic product. In fact, maganda yung sinasabi ng 
country ng Bhutan, no? meron silang Gross National Happiness Index. So hindi GDP, kundi GNH. Gross National Happiness. Dahil yung happiness ng tao ay hindi lang naman po sa economic. Cultural halimbawa, religious halimbawa, political halimbawa. So ibig sabihin, buong tao. Whole person. Ang pangatlo po ay lahat ng tao. Lahat ng tao po, uh, wala, meron, meron di ba, walang iwanan. Merong salita, movement ngayon, walang iwanan. Dahil to exclude majority or even a minority of society from the workings of the society itself actually is the greatest social violence one can inflict on persons. Kapag may nilalaglag sa lipunan, kapag may iniiwanan sa lipunan, kapag may isinantabi sa lipunan, maybe through laws, through what, what, uh, implementation of programs, this is the greatest violence society can ever inflict on persons. So maganda yung maganda yung topic na yon. Para sa akin maganda yung tandaan. Bawat tao ano uh, buong buong bawat tao, buong tao at lahat ng tao. However, I would like to expand or to explode a little bit the whole of society approach. In order to respond to the pandemic, maybe we can expand it a little bit and say the whole of creation approach. Uh, United Nations and the uh, World Health Organization actually has an approach towards the pandemic presently yeah, implemented by WHO. Ang tawag nila doon ay One Health. So the health of human beings is important, kaya vaccines are important, social distancing is important, etc. However, we know that the cause of the pandemic is not just human beings because the disease came from animals. Ang tawag dito ay zoonic, zo zoonotic disease. So, sabi ng United Nations, pwede rin healthy animals. And of course, healthy environment because the zoonotic disease is in fact uh, encouraged, caused by the disruption of the environment. Climate change, deforestation, etc. etc. No? So sa tatlo sa, sa uh, United Nations approach, one health is healthy human beings, healthy animals, and healthy environment. That I would call the whole of creation approach. More comprehensive than the common good that is envisioned by the social teachings before Laudato Si. In, in short, beyond politics, beyond economy, is in fact the environment and the whole of creation. Yan yung first point ko po bilang commentary do, doon sa whole of society approach. Second is, my, my second point is actually uh, about the notion of common good and self-interest. Parang sinasabi sa ating, uh, the, the way we conceptualize this webinar is Parang hindi naman talaga nagkakasundo masyado itong the pursuit of personal good at saka the pursuit of common good. The, uh, the, the poster says that two do not instinctively meet. Parang hindi po automatic talaga sa atin that we let go of our self-interest so that we can work for the common good. 
kahit na napakaganda yung dream for uh, regenerate regeneration and vision for 2020 as mentioned by professor manhit no where citizens are summoned out of their self interest and materialistic pursuits into a public spirited and civic minded devotion to a shared national purpose very actually it's a very hopeful way of encouraging persons to get out of their own clans of their own barrio of their own barangay of their own families to work for the society as a whole pero po parang ang hira po niyan parang hindi po siya parang hindi po siya automatic ang tanong bilang educators is paano po natin yan si sermonan ba natin yung mga estudyante para sila ay maging uh, kapwa oriented or society oriented of course we do that in school we teach them all these values but at the end of the day kuminsan ang sarili pa rin ang nanaig i, I have read i have read uh, many commentators who said actually what reigns in philippine society is not the common good but collective selfishness lack of civic consciousness the lack of the sense of the common diba sabi uh, i'll just give you an example which which you also notice no? very everyday uh, example tulad halimbawa ng We have clean homes but dirty streets and surroundings. Ang linis po ng ating bahay. Wala pong makadapo doon ng kahit anong alikabok dahil sinusunod ng pagpupunas. Pero sa labas niyan, bahala na. So in one way or the other, you have uh, yung makikita mo, malinis ang kotse pero nagtatapon ng candy wrapper, ng sigarilyo sa labas. Makikita mo rin sa pang-araw-araw. Uh, th- this is actually the problem of ecology, di ba? Uh, tinatapo natin ang ating basura sa labas. Noong araw, ang labas ay nasa Smoky Mountain. Doon natin tinatapon lahat. So lahat ng mga tao nagtatapon doon. Noong Smoky Mountain ay nasa loob, nagtatapon tayo ng basura sa payatas. Ay labas yun eh. Ngayon, yung naging yung payatas ay naging loob, nagtatapon naman tayo doon sa San Mateo. Ewan ko kung saan tayo magtatapon hanggang merong labas. Nakabasa po ako sa isang, meron isang meme na nabasa ko. Maganda po yun. Sinasabi niya, from the planet's point of view, there is no throwing garbage out because there is no out. If we consider that we are in and the others are out, then there is out. But if we consider the whole of society, the whole of creation as our common home, as in, something in, then there is no out. You don't throw the garbage out. But you, we as Filipino consciousness doesn't have that mentality. Kaya nga, Medyo hindi ako payag doon sa sinasabi nilang tapat mo, linis mo. I think we have reduced to the minimum what we ought to do as citizens. Tapat mo, linis mo. Bakit hindi na lang po natin gawing bayan ko, linis ko? O di kaya ay mundo ko, linis ko? Dahil wala naman talagang labas. That's one example. One example of the difficulty of the common good in our lives as Filipinos today. So in one way or the other, yung ganong klaseng example, nagmumultiply po yon kahit sa lahat. So halimbawa sa sa politika, so bahala na mangungurakot ako basta yung pamilya ko ay mayaman. So kamkam ng kamkam, kasama doon sa sinasabi ni Professor Manit, yung uh, political dynasties, etc., etc. Bakit? Sila lang ba marunong mag-rule uh, ng society? Hindi. Pero ito na nga, dahil we are in and they are out. 
So we throw whatever we have, uh, garbage we have out. Another example is everyday life sa ngayon is the dilemma of tukhang. I'm trying to understand what, what's going on. Alam naman po natin na mali po yung tukhang. Alam naman po natin na mali pong pumatay. Alam naman po natin na hindi po tama. Kahit sa mga pulis na pumatay, hindi po tama yun. Because, well, they are reared in uh, Christian uh, uh, re religion and faith who tells thou, thou, thou shall not kill is an ultimate command. Pero kahit na hindi po kristyano, bilang tao, hindi naman po tama yun. Alam din natin yun. Ang tanong, bakit maraming taong ayaw magsalita doon? Unang-una, sasabihin nila, huwag na tayong makialam. Baka tayo ang malintikan. So you see, what is important is personal good. Di bali na mamatay yung mga tao sa labas. Nakikita natin? So, pag hindi ko pamilya, okay lang. Dapat namang patayin yung mga yun. Nga hayop kasi yung mga yun. Ang question, kung pamilya ko na, yun, yun yung tanong. Masisira yung frame. Actually, we have a good moral sense. Personal moral sense. However, we actually have very, very weak social conscience. Because of that, no? Uh, ang dami ko pong karanasan dahil po sa payatas po, siguro merong isang daan, 120, ang pinatay. Alam po ninyo, nung pinatay sila, yung mga kapitbahay nila hindi nagsasalita. Ayaw nga dumalaw eh. Yung mga nagdarasal, mga manang na nagdarasal doon, hindi nila dinadalaw samantalang noong araw eh. Sila naman nung uuna doon. Anong, anong, nung tinanong ko, ate, Ba't hindi niyo po dinasalan yun? Sabi ng mga ate, Father, baka madawit kami. Sabi ko, eh di, ano ba, bakit, bakit ba kayo natatakot? Kayo din ba? Ay guilty. Yung hindi naman, Father. O hindi naman pala. So you see, the priority of personal good takes precedence over the common good. My that that is that is present, unobservable in Philippine society. Maybe in our classrooms also, kasi mga teacher naman po tayo. Alam po din natin yon, at nakaki nakikita natin yon, and we can multiply examples along that line. However, I would like to dissect the problem, and I would like to ask the question. Saan ba talaga ang problema? Bakit? Why did I ask that question? Because we can we can keep on we can keep on pontificating. We can keep on sermonizing. And our lessons could be teaching a lot of values which would papasok sa kanang tenga, lalabas sa kaliwa. For these children because because if push comes to shove, actually they are back to their own selfish interests. Di ba? Uh, ganon din sa eleksyon, di ba? Tuturuan mo sila how to vote properly. How to vote properly. E di, tama naman. Makikita mo naman, no? tama. Dapat ito yung criteria. Pero pag dumating na yung nanggagapang dalawang gabi bago mag-eleksyon at may dalang 500 or 1,000, nakakalimutan na yung kanilang voters' education. So where is the problem? Likha ba at likas ba sa Pilipino ang pagiging makasarili? On the, hand, on the one hand, yes, with the examples that I have given. On the other hand, no, because we have also seen bayanihan at work in times of difficulties. Ang mga taong nagtutulungan sa panahon ng sakuna, sa panahon ng bagyo, sa panahon ng lindol, sa panahon ng pagputok ng vulkan. That collective selfishness is lost. Everybody helps one another. Meron pa nga pong namamatay 
sa rescue operation. Nag-alay ng buhay, maligtas lang yung iba. Is that selfishness? No. It's altruism and common good at its best. So likas din sa Pilipino ang common good na sinasabi. At hindi lang po yan sa panahon na sa kuna. I have, uh, ako po ay taga-probinsya, taga-Oslo, Cebu, probinsya po yung sa amin. At sa mga maraming probinsya, probinsya ang nagtrabaho ako. Meron pong mga movements doon. Yung sinasabi ng Professor Manhitio, everyday people's movements of, for example, bayanihan in Tagalog. Or in Cebuano, Dayong. Or in Bohol, Dadjong. No? Or Pahina. No? Or Union. No? Ano, 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 ano yung movement na ito? I, ha I have lived through these movements with the people at, that I have lived with. Halimbawa, sa panahon ng libing. Sa panahon ng libing, ang hirap pong maglibing sa probinsya. Hindi katulad dito, magbayad ka lang ng 5 or 10,000, eh malilibing ka na. Sa probinsya, kung wala kang kahoy, wala kang gagawing, wala kang gagawing kabaong, wala namang punerarya doon. Kung walang magbubuhat, papunta sa sementeryo, wala, hindi mo mabubuhat yung patay mo. Kung walang magluluto sa panahon na ikaw ay nagluluksa, wala pong mangyayari doon sa iyong lamay. In those moments, the whole society comes to help the family. Para naman, sa panahon, yung, ang iba ay namatayan, sila naman ang tutulong sa kanila. Ikaw naman ang tutulong sa kanila. That happens during funerals. That happens during weddings. And that happens, halimbawa, sa taniman, sa pag-ani. In situations... When people are more or less equal in times of need, that common good comes to the fore. When we come to realize that one cannot do it alone because we are all in the same situation, we come to help one another. So likas din sa Pilipino ang maging makikipag, pakikip, ang pakikipagkapwa. However, saan yung problema? At ito po yung nakita kong problema. When society is so unequal, when individual selfishness is praised and rewarded, like the trapos, like the uh, traditional politicians and uh, dynasties, And those who follow the rules are disadvantaged. Then people are back to their own selfish selves. When those who speak out against injustice are imprisoned and killed. And those who kill people are given positions in the government. Then ordinary people are back to defend themselves. When the gap of those who have and those who have none continues. When the gap between those who can and those who cannot in society widens, then it is a normal and spontaneous fight for survival. It is what philosophers call lupus omini homo. That's Latin phrase for a man is a wolf to another man. Para mabuhay, kanya-kanyang kamas dahil walang lipunang kumakalinga sa mga mamamayan. At doon mo nakikita ngayon. At dito ko nakikita ngayon ang problema ng lipunang Pilipino. Ang layo po ng agwat ng mga may kapangyarihan at nang wala. Ang mga taong may kapangyarihan, kung ano-ano na lang sinasabi, ngayon sasabihin, bukas babaguhin, sila pa rin ang namamayan. Ang mga mayayaman, ang mga kapitalista na sumisira ng ating mga bundok para sa mining, mga gubat sa laging 
sila pa rin ang namamayani. This is precisely the problem. Common good has its conditions. And the conditions is a society that cares for each one, for the whole person, and all persons. Babalikan ko yung dalawa kong example at matatapos na ako sa komentary ko. Halimbawa, sa basura. Nagpatapon tayo ng basura, di ba mahuhuli ka ng pulis, etc. Pero sino talagang napaparusahan? Yung nagkakaingin upang mabuhay lamang o yung nagtatapon ng industrial waste dito sa dagat ng Manila Bay na hindi naman hinuhuli. Yung mga sino talaga ang sumisira ng kalikasan? Yung mga katutubong naghahanap buhay lang o yung malalaking dayuhang kumpanyang pumapatag ng ating bundok? Our society rewards those who have power and punishes those who have none. Can you blame the ordinary Filipino to be selfish? He is just protecting himself because in front of power, he is dead. Halimbawa, tukhang. Sino talaga ang pinapatay? Yung mahihirap na drug addict na sinasabing hayop at walang pag-asa? O yung malalaking drug lords na kaibigan naman ng Malacanang? Saan kumikiling ang sistema ng hustisya ng ating bayan? Bakit ang mga nagsasalita ay silang kinukulong at yung mga pumapatay ay silang binibigyan ng gantimpala? So kung ako ay ordinaryong Pilipino, sasabihin ko, bakit nga ba ako magsasalita? kung hindi man ako protektahan ng batas. There is one lesson and my, my point is simple. Consciousness for the common good and making it work in society is not so much a first personal virtue as it is a structural condition. Philosophers have the term called social conditions of possibility. There are structural and social conditions of possibility of common good for it to be working in society. When structures protect the individual good, when you know that the system works for you, when people are not threatened but experience peace and security, when the gap between the rich and the poor are not as large People think and work for the common good. Siguro ang katapusang tanong ay ito. So, ano bang ibig sabihin yan sa education? Ano bang ibig sabihin yan para sa ating mga educators? Twofold. Number one, we continue to teach personal virtues of common good, of kapwa orientation, civic mindedness, and the whole of society approach to our problems. We can do that in our classes. Natuturuan natin kung ano ang tama, kung ano ang hindi tama. However, with the, with the things that I have mentioned, I think we should also teach our students to fight so that this world will be, will be a more equal place to live in. In short, only when this world is equal, only when the structures of society protect each and whole and all persons, will common good exist in society. And people begin to think of contributing to the common good. Hanggang dito na lang po at uh, siguro meron pa tayong discussion. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat, uh, Father Danny. At uh, kanina, no, uh, we listened to uh, Professor Manhit. So, um, 
actually I'm personally overwhelmed by all the things that I heard I heard from the two of you both very powerful uh, uh, presentations and a lot to digest so Kanina, no, I was already posting about this political integrity, you know, civic pride, civic regeneration, the whole of society versus whole of government, until it became whole of society versus whole of creation from Father Danny. And then we spoke about common good versus collective selfishness. Um, May mga questions tayo, pero umpisa ko sa sarili kong tanong. Kasi nga medyo ang dami no, na dapat nating i-digest. Uh, I'd like to go back to that, uh, what uh, Professor Manhit talked about. Filipinos should demand, demand right governance, demand good governance. But in the context of educators kasi, for, for us, uh, in, in teaching, no, we know that you can only demand if you are, you know, you're, you're knowledgeable. You're critical, you're assertive, you're confident. And because it is not happening, does it mean that the education system has failed? You know, you look at all your, your, your syllabi all over. Critical thinking is supposedly being developed, right? Assert, assertiveness being developed. You're supposedly developing social responsibility and a social conscience. But what? why is it? that apparently it's not happening. I'll speak from my, in my own little experience of 26 years of teaching uh, in a university where I tried to push these values, even tried to push it as a public official and even tried to push it as an advocate in civil society. It takes a lot for, for you as a teacher to, to put it at the core of why you exist. I, I remember when I became chairman of a department, then I became an undersecretary of government. I came back and the first thing I told, I took a leave for five years. Took a, and when I came back to university, people were surprised. Why is a top official of government? Why is a former chairman teaching basic subjects? And I told myself, it was my choice. I teach either two major subjects, but I make sure I teach a basic subject. Because in that basic subject, I said, I reach more people. I reach different colleges in, in the university. And I saw that as part of my service. Then moving forward, when I became very involved in institute, people were saying, why are you still teaching at eight o'clock in the morning. I was taking 7.30 classes, eight eight. So I said, no, you have to do your part. Because I saw in myself as a teacher, as an educator, as I have a role in society. I'm not here simply to take the salary. This is not simply a profession, but it's something that is the reason why I'm here. I might have evolved from where I started as an ordinary, faculty lecturer, but I saw myself because I was hoping teachers see themselves that way. Uh, I was hoping that educators see themselves as, just imagine the, what's happening now that we're allowing, I even rewriting history about dictatorship, rewriting history about plunder in our country. We should be the first one to, to tweak our curriculum and say, wait, there are facts. 1972 to 1986 was one of the worst economic part for history. But nobody talks about that. Parang nagiging alternative point of view, the minority. Instead of, that is what is factual. That's why I said, we live in a pandemic of disinformation. And the education sector plays a role. But it takes a lot, of course, from teachers who are really challenged by their day-to-day. Uh, realities also of being educators. But we need to see ourselves more than the requirements of the school, more than I, I made myself, even at the height of activities outside the university, it's very accessible to student organizations. Any activity, I will make myself available 
for student organization in uh, Because I made it part of my, my core values of said earlier. But it is about what teaching is. I, I just felt sad that I did not stay long in the education department, basically three years. But it is something that was part two of my education, son, if I stayed long. But I had to go back to the university after my third year. Two, that we need the public school system, we need the private school educator also at the core values of people to, to be at the core of shaping this kind of thing. So we can demand and we can be better voters and better citizens every election cycle because it will be part of it every three years, every six years we elect people. That's my little take on that. Thank <laughs> on you. That Father Danny, you want to answer? Um, may, may problema ba sa education system? O hindi mm. kaya kasi hindi nandyan yung the home. Nandyan ang social media. Nandyan ang traditional media so baka hindi kaya ng school yeah uh, hindi naman siguro aakuin ng eskwelahan ang lahat ng problema sa lipunan ito dahil dapat aakuin din ng pamilya aakuin din ng religion aakuin din ng politics pero siguro in terms of educational direction ito yung sinabi ko kanina that we teach beyond values Val values are ideal and the students understand. But there are hard realities in life which they learn beyond what we teach. So which means to see also the structures of the educational system, which actually teaches more than the values that we teach. Example, a lot of education educators, principal man yan, o teacher man yan, o kung sino man yan sa DepEd, actually are more dictators than the political dictators. So we, we have our own hierarchies and the hierarchies actually do not define what common good is all about. So maraming struktura ng ating education na dapat baguhin din para matuto yung mga estudyante kung ano yung common good. Uh, I'll give you an anecdote. Noong kami tinuruan ng oblong Grade 2 pa ako. This is an oblong. And what do you remember with an oblong? Said our teacher. Egg, ma'am. Egg. Oh, very good. Tomorrow, each one will bring an egg. Eh di lahat kami. Kung anong sasabihin ng teacher, ay eh, dapat gawin mo. Sinabi ni teacher eh. So bawat isa may itlog. Trintaidos kami. Di trintaidos ng itlog. Nakita ko, kinain ang mga faculty member noong lunchtime yung itlog namin. Well, what does that tell me as a young student? Aha, pwede ko palang gawin ito para sa kapakanan namin, o sa kapakanan ng teacher, at hindi sa kapakanan ko. Pag teacher ako, ganun din ang gawin ko. These are structures, and I'm only talking about eggs, but there are a lot more in the educational system that needs rehauling in order to make that common good realistic, and not just, just a teaching or a module. Thank you. Ewan ko kung tama yun. <laughs> 32 naman siguro yung teacher sa faculty room. Exacto, no? Exacto sa bilang. Sige, doon tayo sa ano. Yung kinuha ko kanina yung na, na, na ano ko rito. I struck by this. And uh, Professor Manihit and Father Danny, no? please uh, both respond to this. Gross national happiness. Uh, medyo may concern ako dyan kasi mga Filipino parang laging masaya, di ba? Uh, kahit na anong, anong delubyo, kahit na anong, uh, uh, you know, whatever. You know, it's, it's we're practically, we're a happy people. So uh, is that positive or negative? And I'll connect it to, we're a forgiving or forgetful people ba? And then connect it pa to the, this one. Uh, I, I think this is um, hype there. Eh? Minsan romanticized our resilience. Parang, oh, kasi Filipino, you know, we're resilient, we're resilient. No? So, combining all of this, sometimes it, it, it makes us less demanding of government. I'll try to answer that first, uh, Father. Yes. Uh, okay. I, I, I see those things as positive, you know, the happiness, the resiliency. 
And I always put this argument that, can you imagine how easy it is to take care of the Filipino people, but we still exploit them? Because they, what they simply want, when, when I hear all those resiliency, happiness, or forgiving, is that they just want to create an environment whereby their own life can thrive. They don't. But we try to create this mendicancy to the patronage political system. Like, I don't think that's what people that are less fortunate want. Because when they go into being an OFW, which has become a life-saving option for a lot, they sacrifice everything. And they build from there. And no support from government whatsoever. They even get charged by government through different uh, demands. Uh, so so I, I see it as, imagine if only, that's why very basic in my subjects. And I always tell them that uh, when, I, when, when I was in graduate school, you know, in UP, we have this habit of our teachers are really absentee teachers. That's why I did not teach in UP, though I came from UP. They might get mad at me. And I said, I was finishing my first graduate subject. And the teachers not really taught me anything except kept on repeating accountability, accountability. But we were left on our own to be. Then after the first semester in graduate school, I realized maybe she meant something. That at the end of the day, if we can only have accountability. And that is some value that I hope the Filipinos realize that government exists for us. It's not the other way around. Political leaders and all these dynastic families exist for us. We vote them, but we have to make them accountable. That's, I remember when I served Brother Andrew, the Brother Andrew with the Department of Education. And we came both from the private sector. Our first general meeting with the leadership of the Department of Education. People were surprised on one thing. Secretary Gonzalez and me we were lining up to get their food. Why? They thought we were God, the new gods of the Department of Education, the new secretary and the young undersecretary. And we got surprised, sir, we need to serve you. I said, why? We line up in La Salle to get our canteen food. We line up. Uh, that's me. I, I, I said I came from the Senate. We don't need to be served that way. But that kind of culture at times. I see top officials, people with political power, people with economic power are higher than us. Could be true. But that's not what Philippine society ought to be. Philippine society should take care of people. And I, felt, I feel that maybe our politicians have made our public less educated, <laughs> continue to be poor because they can dictate on them. Because the moment these people become educated, the first thing that happens and gets a job, gets a livelihood, they become free from patronage. And I'm hoping schools can play that role. Let's teach that. We don't need to serve these people, they're supposed to serve us. And in an in a issue critical to me, always close to my heart, West Philippine Sea, I kept on very critical to this conversation. When 93% of Filipinos tell you that you need to assert your rights, I believe that this government should listen to us. And stop talking about the greatness of the Communist Party of, of China. Because government exists for the Filipino people, not the other around, not for relationships that we don't matter. I was trying to be less political, Father Danny, but you inspired me because I can talk very political. <laughs> If you just, I know this is an education group, so I try to control myself. But so I, I add with that response for this question, Doris. Yeah, we're we're allowing you to like, uh, you know, not be so controlled. <laughs> okay, Father Danny, ikaw, anong tingin mo dito? Ah, uh, okay. Ah, uh, pwede naman siguro maging political, di ba? <laughs> okay. Ang ang gross national happiness, in fairness to Bhutan. And of course, it's it's of course it's later on adopted by the United Nations. Is actually 
not just happiness as happiness no na palagi tayong tumatawa nag nag-enjoy tayo kahit nasa baha etc nag-wave pa sa camera kahit na, na nalulunod na mga ganun hindi yan because gross national happiness is in fact a measurement okay. of all factors from economy to politics to culture and to religious participation for instance all that added actually amounts to how happy and how contented the people are in a specific society kaya nga meron actually that's also measured in the scandinavian countries etc etc that women are as equal as men or the poor there may be poor but it is not the yung agwat ay hindi napakalayo in in one way or the other so gross national happiness to understand it better means all these factors needed to make people have ginhawa. Di ba? Na mararanasan nila yung kaginhawahan. Yung sinasabi ng Professor Manit, hindi naman talaga napakalaki ang gusto ng mga Pilipino para guminhawa. Tama lang na makapag-aral yung kanilang anak, makakain ng tatlong beses sa ilang isang araw, makapunta sa mall paminsan-minsan, etc. etc. No? But 60... 70% of our people does not have that. So, yun yun yung actually yun yung problema, yung agwat na yon. Kaya medyo ma, ma, matinding maabot yung uh, mahirap maabot yung national gross national happiness. Pero anong connection niyan doon sa mga resilience, you know, we are a happy people? Those concepts are used ideologically by people of power in order to keep those who have none in their places and people of power would mean political power like government ngayon ay sinasabi nilang we are doing well in our response to the pandemic and we can have vaccine to all during christmas good luck good luck na lang sa atin dahil we have only vaccinated 2 to 3% how can you give that christmas eh kalokohan yun this is precisely This is precisely why terms like resilience can be used ideologically to keep themselves in power. Well, pwede rin gamitin niya ng religion. Sasabihin ng pare, sige, uh, maging maligaya lang kayo sa langit, meron naman kayong kaligayahang walang hanggan. Doon wala ng sakit at wala ng sakuna. So that is still religious Manipulation in ideological, ideological use of the same discourse. Pero ang point ko, pwede rin niyang gamitin ng teacher. Pwede rin gamitin sa eskwelahan. Those instruments of ideological power to keep our students in their places. Don't ask, I am your teacher. Pareho lang yan ni Digong na nagsasabing, huwag ka magtanong. Papakulong kita. Powerful. Ah, bato-bato sa langit ito. From Leonard Lay, kudos to PAC for staging the series of talks regarding the state of our society. A good eye-opener. Ayan. Pero tayong question dito, ah, konektado sa mga sinabi ninyo. From Lionel Casimiro. Trust in government. See how? You know, I think that is what they see as a problem at this time. So how do we go about this when they can see that we actually uh, possibly no, need to encourage people to trust government again? Uh, Doris, you'll be surprised that there's a high trust on government. There is, huh? Yeah, uh, because again, data-driven. The only question is, what's the basis of the trust? That's why I earlier mentioned pandemic of disinformation. They have built it on lies. They have used the, this, uh, this liberating medium of social media as a way to shape this pandemic of disinformation since 2016. And we have seen that uh, as we saw a rise of 87% million social media users in a country. Maybe some of them are trolls. But majority are not. So they're being shaped by this disinformation. And that's why they're believing and trusting 
I think the counter to that is we have to fight this disinformation, focus on what is factual. We can even simply rely on government data and check if we will still trust these leaders. That's why I always am hopeful. Uh, I, it was described by Father Dan earlier that I'm a very hopeful presentation. I'm always hopeful when it's near election time. I'm hopeful that things change, especially uh, in our current situation, the way they have handled the pandemic, the massive disinformation that we have seen, the way we should have been asserting ourselves on more important things externally than asserting ourselves on ordinary small people in communities with the use of coercive forces. But we need trust really, because I, I did this study before. It shows my other hat. I used to run political campaigns. I did a study 2003, and I realized that the government was so distrusted. I'm referring to the Gloria Macapagal Arroyo government. Nobody believed me. But I always say, it's the science. So I built a campaign that was my last national campaign. I ran the campaign of Fernando Po. I did not know him. I was just introduced by now Senate President Soto and I said, this is a nice experiment. Government is this trusted by the public. I think seven out of 10 Filipinos distrusted Gloria Macapagaloro. So I built a campaign against distrust because what you need is just to trust. It might not be the most qualified, but you need to trust that person. Fast forward to 2019, I was invited by, by VP Lenny Robredo to talk to her, to the Ocho de Rech. I said, you're running the campaign wrong. You're focusing your effort on an issue which is where the president is being trusted, maybe rightly or wrongly, talk about the drug war. Nine out of 10 Filipinos is supportive of it. Unless we focus on the actual killings, I said. But where they are distrusted is on corruption issues. The reason I'm sharing this is that now as we enter 2022, we're doing a study and happily, I will be happy to share it. What are we looking for in our leaders in 2022? It's being run by social weather station for us separately and by Pulse Asia. That means two separate respondents, two different periods in a matter of two weeks. And what are the issues that we want people to raise? The reason why I'm studying that is I will use that as I call data-driven basis to say that this is what the public wants. What is your answer, Mr. Candidate, Madam Candidate? And we have to build on that. No, I, I call it, and I was talking to different NGOs at times, which is ideologically driven. I always tell them, stop bringing me your ideological position papers. Why don't you start listening first to the public? Oh, there's, but we are the public, sir. I was, we are the 10,000 urban poor. There's 108, 9 million Filipinos, I said. Do you really matter at 10,000? There's a science behind it. Let's look at the national. That's why I always say for the common good. No, that's why we're called political scientists. And they say, oh, you're right. Said, he said, the problem is you use your organization to say, this is what the whole country wants. Not necessarily. The other group wants it. That's why, said, that's why we're all taught statistics in high school and in college. Because there's a way to measure. And we're trying to measure that. We did not do this in 2015 because we felt, you know, the Aquino government had a good run, and maybe we can learn from that experience of five years without realizing it can totally be erased after six months of disinformation by the current government. So I said, maybe it's time to ask that. So hopefully I can share that in future discussion in your group. Yes. And let's demand that. That's why I always let's stand. And this is what the public wants. Maybe we collectively we can say that let's demand this from from whoever the candidates are after October. Father Danny, you want to? Uh, yeah, uh, trust in government. Uh, I, I agree with Professor Dindo on, on, on this. Uh, we First, we need to trust government and maybe hard data will tell us at the moment, maybe majority of the Filipinos still trust the government regardless of the reasons for doing so. Um, 
in 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 personal experience marami din namang mga tao sa gobyerno na kapanipaniwala uh, marami din mga tao sa gobyerno is who is intent on doing good for the country some of them we know some others we don't know that being said i would also like to say that there is a healthy distrust which is necessary in order to make the system work. And the critical component of society, regardless if we are going against the grain, regardless if I am one or 20%, is necessary in order for that common good to be inclusive. So, alam ko sa sistema, uh, there is always a tendency of the system to exclude its others. Other thinking, other ways of doing things, uh, others, no? Uh, like, like the yung mga addict ay others, yung mga communist ay others, yung mga human rights ay others. But precisely, we need the voices of those others to be able ito yung tabi, tabi, sabi ko a eh, collab collab oh, ito, uh, critical collaboration to critically collaborate with that with the system of government to make it more inclusive at doon doon napapasok doon lang papasok yung common good kung yung common good ay para sa lahat ay eh, dapat lahat dahil sinabi nga ni Pope Francis Social exclusion is the greatest social violence you can ever inflict in society. Yun yung, hanggang doon lang muna, Doris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Father mm -hmm. Danny. Uh, comment ito no, from uh, Shepard Abejo. Thank you for the opportunity to give our comments. I salute the administration for their effort to help the Filipinos and also the Department of Education. Uh, criticizing government uh, is uh, rather biased. And that, uh, siguro, this is for Father Danny, no? Pero pwede, uh, if you want to answer, if we keep on preaching the word of the Lord, then why are there criminals? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, unang una, hindi ko alam kung, well, of course, the criminals, uh, just like anybody, the word of the Lord uh, is sifted through in its personal life. And we don't have to judge the criminals. We don't know what they went through in their own lives. Many of them abused. Many of them oppressed. Many of them almost killed. And maybe you would know, you would not know, how difficult it is in their lives. So they are driven towards other things which we call criminality. So hindi po natin, hindi po natin mahuhusgahan ang buhay nila. Hindi po ibig sabihin na hindi sila nakinig sa word of God o nakikinig sa mga taong nag, nag, ano, sa kanina, nag, nag advise sa kanila. Uh, we leave that judgment to God. And maybe what society do, what society can do, is to help these criminals live better lives. And only then, with that structure, can criminal being in, can the criminal being encouraged to live a new life will change his life. Precisely, that's my point from the beginning. It's not just about preaching values. It's creating social structures that make people change their lives. Yeah. Salamat po. Yeah. I actually wrote that, no? Common good. It's not a personal virtue. No? It's a structural condition. Question from Sally Nolasco Santos. For both of you, uh, Professor Banhit, Father Danny, how can we teach our students and restore civic uh, regeneration when they see our public servants using their position for self-interest? and materialistic pursuits, meaning like the models out there are not exactly good models. Then 
Uh, my simple answer to that is that's why we need civic regeneration to change that model. That this is not what we want. This is not what Philippine society deserves. We deserve public officials that are not only transparent in their actions, that are not only, but should only always be accountable and responsive to the general public. When, when you just ask, when people just ask, how, how why are we so fascinated with such wow stuff, wow lifestyle of public officials, when officially they cannot afford that. It, the hardest part of my career was when I was in government. I think the secretary of one of my sisters were earning more than me than an undersecretary because she was in a corporate structure. That was my joke in my family. But I always tell them, at least they call me honorable. <laughs> but that was a good experience. I was undersecretary at 29 until 35 or before I turned 35, so a little over five years. That was hard. But I had a family support system that uh, took care of my other needs. Uh, my father uh, uh, allowed me to use one of his property to say, I cannot afford. But I was undersecretary already. A lot higher in terms of salary standardization than generals even, than I see generals. So, but that's what, that's what I'm saying. But how come we cannot make them accountable? Why are we awed by this type of show of economic power? Instead of, di ba dapat, yeah. we embarrass them. You're scandalized. Or we, 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 we tell their children, oh, kamsa naman, but ganito ang bahay niyo. Eh, di ba ganito lang kita ng tatay mo? But nobody does that. I always tell people, we, when I, I teach this course, public management or public administration, when we discuss corruption, I said, we all hate corruption unless it's a relative or our friend. My students will tell me, what do you mean, sir? Come on, how many of you have used that house of your friend or your relative? Or even your parents knock on that door of that powerful relative of yours. Instead of, instead of condemning them, embarrassing them in front of the power. You're not invited, you're a corrupt official. That kind of values. It's, a, it's for us to change that. I don't, I cannot, we cannot demand that to majority of our people because they're Sad to say they're poor. That means they feel powerless. But imagine if we build a strong middle class as it grows and grows with economic growth. And this is the values for middle class. Graduate students of private education. We start teaching that, demanding that from families. Come on. I, I, I used to tell people, come on, in your latest or last Christmas gathering, sino ang pinakabida? Di ba si Kong? Si Congressman? Eh, mababa ang sweldo na ni. Compared to a private sector attorney. Pero bida si Congressman. Mamimigay pa yan sa mga kamag-anak niya ng cash. Without anyone asking, where did the cash come from? Hindi pa nga lang galing corruption. Isang galing pa sa illegal gambling. Isang galing pa sa drug so, para, kinima, pero ayaw natin ng drugs, ayaw natin ng illegal gun. So, at times, and this is beyond, no? this is not about this administration. This is the political culture that we have had in our country. Sad to say, post-EDSA. I always, we, when I gather with my friends, we, we spent four years of our life run, being run after by police just to bring down the dictator. And we always ask, is this what we want 30, 40 years after? We're here. But, but Father Danny, I'm always hopeful. That's why I always say things that things can change. We can regenerate. No? Wherever I am, uh, I still believe that we can overcome all these challenges. No? Though my father, I have an 82-year-old father. Uh, maybe 15 years ago, he told me, when will you stop thinking that things can change? Because I'm the only one who went to public service and NGO works on me. And I said, the moment I stop thinking that things can change, then nothing can change. So I will continue thinking that things will change. And I've been blessed well. I mean, we have a strong faith as a family, Catholic faith. I said, look, 
I did well in government. I had a hard part in terms of financial, but the private sector took care of me afterwards because I was a clean, decent public servant. And Stratbase is the biggest consulting firm in public affairs in the Philippines today. And I run the biggest think tank in the Philippines through the support of the private sector. Because the first thing they realized, I did not enrich myself. And I continued my advocacy. So sometimes you do your little victories one at a time. So that's what I encourage people who are part of this. Thing. Little victories collectively becomes victory, big victories for our nation. That's a good point. Father Danny. No, no, tinanong mo yun, na, naisip ko yung sub-commentary ng ibang mga tao. Bakit yung mga Pilipino pasaway sa sariling bayan, pero magaling naman na sumunod pag dumating sa United States, sa Great Britain, etc. Uh, siguro dahil, una, dahil sa models na nakikita nila. Uh, pero ikalawa, dahil din sa structures kung saan sila nakatira. When the structures work for you, then your own personal virtue is developed towards upholding that structure because that structure defends you. Pero sa Pilipinas, ito na nga, eh, kanya-kanyang kamas. Dahil yung struktura, hindi lang yung struktura, pati yung mga namumuno ay handa kang patayin kung ikaw ay pasaway. Medyo kailangan natin ng matapang-tapang na mga tao. Unang-una, para tumakbo at baguhin yung struktura. Ikalawa, para magsalita at sabihin, hindi tama ito. Now, ang, ang ano ko kasi sa, sa, sa educational system, I think it's about time that we teach our students that not only critical thinking, but also the courage to be able to speak up when the structures in place are not helping us. Yun lang siguro. When the structures in place mean, means the principal, <laughs> means the teacher, means the, also the mayor, etc., etc. So yun, yun po. Sa so tingin ko, kulang yung, kulang yung education towards that because education is towards obedience. Obedience to powers. Mahirap po yun. Pag puro obedience, tinuturo din yan ng religion, obedience. Mali po yun. Hindi po tama yun. Yan ang dahilan kaya tayo nagkakaganito. Thank you po. Obedience talaga ang dahilan, Father Danny. Okay. Sige, since we're about to conclude uh, this morning's forum, uh, I'd like to give you one last chance Uh, we did this yesterday. Sabi namin, sige, what insight, what thought would you like to leave those who are uh, at this time watching this and then will eventually watch the recording so that um, if all the big ideas no, uh, of today's forum are all forgotten, what is it that they should not forget? On my part, I would simply talk about those three words, whole of society. It takes the Philippine society, not political leadership, not the president, not members of Congress, but whole of society. That means all of us. No matter how weak you see yourself, you have a role to play. No matter how wealthy you are, you have a responsibility to those who are weak. So it's a whole of society approach. This pandemic taught us that a strong man does not have the solution. A strong, arrogant, populist man cannot even buy us vaccines. And we need to buy the, the weakest vaccine. There's something wrong with that. But a friendly leader will be supported by the world, especially when the Philippine society demands that from them. It's simple. We're in a pandemic. Where are our friends? They were willing to help, but we kept on emphasizing countries like China. Russia, who's not even part of our daily life, because it's one thinking of one, one group. But the whole society will reflect the thinking of the Philippine society. And if we can find that whole of society approach as a way of dealing with 
this pandemic and dealing with the challenges post-pandemic, then we can overcome and find the common good and overcome any challenges to recover in our country. And that's what we need to do. Beyond 2022, this will not be solved by the election. The, the next government will be left with a lot of problems of, because of a lot of missteps by the current government. So we need to work together as a whole as a society. I'm not being siding with one over the other, but we need to work together. Thank you, Professor Manhit. And Father Danny. Uh, ano lang? Common good. Hashtag bawat tao, buong tao, at lahat ng tao. Ikalawang hashtag, Common good is beyond personal virtue. It has its own structural conditions. Salamat po. On that note, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Dindo Manhit and Father Danny Pilario, CM, for uh, this morning's uh, webinar. This has been very, very uh, instructive no, for all of us. Even while we were like conceptualizing this webinar, we didn't realize you know, that these were the, the concepts and the constructs you know, that we were introducing and that this is how we should be looking at all of this in order for this nation to move forward. So I'd like to uh, thank all of you. And of course, thank our friends and partners you know, who cross-posted this uh, webinar, the Coordinating Council of Private Educational Association, the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, the Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities, Intelligente Publishing, uh, who also cross-posted, uh, and of course, the members of the PAC National Secretariat. I'd like to especially acknowledge uh, Presi Labao and Bush Everola for uh, working with me to conceptualize leader. And the rest of the secretariat, uh, Terence Bar Barido, Red Gallego, May Di Malanta, Mark Austria, the entire staff from the Training and Development Unit, the Information Technology and Information Management Unit, our Communications and Research Unit, and our Finance Unit for uh, ensuring that uh, we are able to uh, uh, deliver uh, a program that our uh, stakeholders, mostly private education uh, educators, Will be will find very uh, relevant, especially now that we are once away from the 2022 national elections. We'd like to invite uh, everyone, and this is still for conceptualization. But Professor Manhit gave us ideas. January 2022, we shall be having leader four. By then, we would be knowing we know who are running, right? And we would have crafted an education agenda, and we actually have seen the survey you know, from. Uh, Strat base. So uh, this can guide us as to how uh, January 2022 leader four will be. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyo lahat at uh, magandang umaga po. <laughs>